In the name of the Creator and the Redeemer and the Sustainer, Amen. Just be seated. Well, I think it's such a wonderful coincidence that we are celebrating Earth Day and the third Sunday of Easter with its resurrection narratives. We are um, now hearing our third resurrection story this Sunday, in this case from Luke chapter 24. And um, this is one of my favorite stories, and, and I will explain why in a minute. So here is Jesus, and um, if you can imagine Jesus suddenly coming back from the dead, you've seen him crucified, buried, and all of a sudden this person appears showing the wounds. Now, I don't know about you, but when I imagine Jesus, I, I would just imagine this being an, an amazing, incredible moment. And, what I, but when I've done all of my theological research on this and um, read multiple biblical commentaries about resurrection narratives, and in particular Luke 24, I pondered deeply and I came up with this profound finding. Jesus loves seafood. <laughs> Imagine this, he's come back from the dead sees the shocked and amazed and disbelieving disciples, and he says, do you have anything to eat? And in John 21, which is my absolute favorite resurrection story, he's on the beach and he says, hey, you got any fish on the boat? The man loves seafood. And what I love about it is that it's so banal, so normal. It's like your brother coming over to your house and saying, you got anything in your fridge? What the commentators do say is that it's emphasizing the pure, raw physicality of the risen Jesus. This is no ghost. This is no apparition or spirit. This is the incarnate God back from the dead. And it's demonstrated by the fact that he shows his wounds to them, he's speaking to them, and he is hungry. So the way the risen Christ appears is as broken still and asking for us to feed him. Um, I was reading a book by Sally McFaig, I actually read it a while back and was rereading it, called The Body of God. And what many uh, uh, ecological theologians like Sally McFaig are writing about these days is that we need to get back in touch with the nature of all creation being the body of God, the physical earthly manifestation of God. This is not the same thing as saying that nature is God, that a tree or these beautiful flowers are God, but that all of the creative energy of the Christ is suffused through them and they are a manifestation. They are a sacrament in as much as this is a sacrament when the Holy Spirit infuses the bread and the wine. Sally McFaig encourages us to see it as a sacrament so that we will treat creation as holy. Now, she's joined by um, the Franciscan theologian Elia Delio, the, the uh, Jesuits John Howe, Dennis Edwards. I mean, there's a whole host of theologians who are writing about this. Elizabeth Johnson and at Fordham is doing it as well. And they are all pointing back to St. Bonaventure of the 14th century, every single one of them. My, one of my favorite Franciscans, um, the first famous Franciscan theologian. And what he did was, as he was considering the nature of the Trinity, he would say, well, God is pure love. And Christ, the Son, the second person, the Word, is love made manifest to us, made apparent to us. And so when we say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, we speak of God speaking creation, and all of that is full of the word that God has spoken. So Jesus of Nazareth is the physical manifestation in the body of a man, but is also throughout all creation, through every cell, every rock, every worm, every tree, God, the Christ. You've heard of this probably in Gaelic and Franciscan spirituality, this nature of, this nature of the um, creative energy of God suffused throughout all of physical nature. Now, it's a lovely idea and, and one that I subscribe to theologically and spiritually, but I think it's very easy to get kind of way out there and abstract about the cosmic Christ. And it's important to remember 
that the risen Christ as first known is a broken body asking for food. If you consider all of creation, the body of God or the body of Christ, then I think we have to acknowledge that this body of God, this nature, is broken and battered and asking to be fed. Now I'm speaking of climate change, also known as global warming, which has broken the body of the earth. We are suffering in many ways and, and uh, critters are dying and human beings are dying, species are dying away as a result of human behavior. Now what's happening is that our atmosphere is filling with too much carbon dioxide. This is due to the excess burning of fossil fuels and coal. Um, it is uh, heating up the atmosphere and, and burning through the ozone layer. And this is being exacerbated by the overproduction of methane gas on the Earth. And the main culprit of that is beef producing and beef eating nations such as da -da -da -da, the US of A, because uh, cows, as a natural byproduct of their digestive system, release a lot of methane gas. What can I say? <laughs> and it exacerbates the heating up of the atmosphere. So it is the human consumption of beef and it is the human burning of fossil fuels and, and coal that are the main culprits for this. As a result, the polar ice caps and the glaciers are melting. The ocean has risen about an inch all around the world. The, heat, the water is heating up in the ocean and fish species are dying. So when Jesus comes to dinner, what fish would we feed him when they're dying away? This is causing the coastal farmlands to flood, and the coastal farmlands are where the poorest people in the world farm. And so the, they're flooding, they're losing their, um, their land because it's either flooded or too salinated now. They're moving inland, fighting battles with villagers and killing them to get the dry land inland. But that's not going to be so great either because the dry land inland is also drought-stricken. Not just on I-5, if you travel anywhere in California, you'll see the signs of drought all over the place, but also around the world, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. Our earth is cracked and damaged and dying. The soil literally needs nutrients and food to be restored. Now, it's interesting that when scientists talk about climate change, I read an article by Paul and Anne Ehrlich, who are um, a biologists at Stanford University, and they said that there have been over 1,200 studies on climate change, 2,500, 2,500 scientific experts and um, reviewers of these studies from 130 countries. They said it's basically the most affirmed, confirmed, proven scientific occurrence in the history of scientific um, exploration. 97% of climate scientists agree that it is human behavior that is causing the problem. But guess what happens when you ask non-scientists? Less than 50% believe that human behavior has anything to do with it. And as we know, there are a lot of people who are in absolute denial that climate change is even happening, right? They're just saying, oh, so things are getting a little hotter. It's just a natural cycle. Well, some of this is a natural cycle and some is not. But people denying the damaged earth, the losses of species, the people dying of starvation, is like people looking at Jesus coming into the room, showing them his wounds, asking for food, and disbelieving. If you remember Luke, Luke 24, wherever it was being read, um, the, it says the disciples, in their joy, were disbelieving. That's because sometimes something is so impossible to conceive, so improbable, seems like such a violation of the way we understand nature to work that we can't think it's possible. People cannot come back from the dead. We couldn't possibly, we little human beings, we couldn't possibly destroy creation, could we? And it's just as likely that people find it hard to believe in sort of the miraculous healing, the miraculous turning around that happens in the resurrection. Jesus rising from the dead to show us there are times when God's power trumps what's happening in, in human evil, what human evil can do, do to us. The key is believing in the power of resurrection. 
If we accept that creation, all of nature, is somehow an emanation of God's love, that God's creative energy is through it, then we need to also accept that it must have some of the resurrectional power, the revivification that comes from God. That, too, is the nature of Christ. It's not just that it's broken and battered. It is also capable of coming back to life. Now, my colleague Jim Leduhar, our director of giving, told me this wonderful story that he saw on a PBS nature show. And at first, I really wondered, could, could that be true? And so I looked up some research, and sure enough, it's true. Um, the story began as I heard it, and about 30 years ago, there was an African farmer, and his village was dying of starvation because they were uh, drought-stricken. The, the land was very hard and dry. This is in, uh, I believe, Burkina Faso in the sub-Saharan Africa. And he had an idea. And he explained his idea to all the villagers, and they said, that's crazy. What he did was he dug deep holes, and in those holes, he put animal dung, put it way down there. The dung apparently attracts termites, the most despised of bugs. And so the termites would go down the holes, and they would dig these intricate tunnels and caverns for themselves, but they were great repositories for rainwater. So then when it rained, the rain would go down, deep down into the cool earth, would not be touched by the hot sun, so would not evaporate. He brought back their farmland by doing this, by burying these holes of dung and letting the termites take care of the problem. He has basically rebuilt the Garden of Eden. His village is thriving today. They, he was able to plant fruit, fruit trees and vegetables. And they call him their savior because he's brought this back. This is now being repeated all around sub-Saharan Africa and in parts of Australia. They're using termite and ant hills for, to do the same thing. It requires a belief that there is the power of resurrection in the very things that are dying or even have already died. And what I love about this story is that even though humans cause the problem of climate change that is causing drought, a more severe drought in parts of the world, it was a human being working in concert with other parts of nature to turn the situation around and with the basis yuckiest parts of human nature, I mean of, of nature, not human nature, um, animal dung, termites, little bugs, snakes, ants, mud. I have to tell you that my, uh, when I was reading these commentaries, I was so pleased when I read this um, commentary in Hermeneia because they basically said that people have been wondering whether Jesus digested the fish, if you know what I'm saying. I wondered the same thing. I just thought, how human is Jesus? I mean, if he ate fish, didn't he have to go to the bathroom later? It's a, it's a great question to wonder about because it shows how the earthiest aspects of creation are the sources of redemption. What Jesus asks us to do at the end of that gospel is to be witnesses to the resurrection and the redemptive power, the salvific power of resurrection. I saw another example of it in my community last week. I was at the court across the street with a, a church member who was facing charges, and we were in the court for several hours. And many of people were coming before the judge for um, DUI charges, driving under the influence. Most of them pled no contest, and this involves hearing a long speech from the judge about what the consequences are for pleading no contest and what would happen to them if they were ever caught driving drunk again. And part of their homework is that they need to take a class on alcohol abuse and alcohol addiction, and sometimes they also are required to attend AA classes. So I saw defendant after defendant coming up and admitting the wrongdoing. And I saw the judge praising them when the letters they had from their alcohol abuse classes showed that they had been faithful attendees, that they had been doing very well in the class. And she was so merciful and compassionate. She would praise them and encourage them and say, you're doing a great job. Keep going. It was a sort of resurrection for them, the defendants, who had another chance. They would not have to go to jail. They would pay fines and they'd get another chance. It was also, for me, a sign of redemption to see the judge being so compassionate and so loving and forgiving 
towards these people who had made a mistake, who had broken the law. And I have another example that is even more intimate and personal when people ask me, well, gee, how do you experience God or how do you experience Christ? Um, Twelve years ago, my little brother died of scleroderma. This was after my mother died of it when I was 17, my aunt died of it, and my next door neighbor died of it. Uh, I grew up in Silicon Valley, and um, there's some research that shows, but has not definitively proven, that there's a locus of scleroderma cases right where I grew up, because the semiconductor companies had copper in their chips, and they would use fluids, cleaning fluids, to, to clean them that had PVCs in them, and it got into the groundwater and has poisoned the groundwater in Silicon Valley. It's toxic. Now, when my brother died, you might think that I would be extremely bitter about this, bitter towards the industry. And yet, when he died, I was um, with my sisters in the Bay Area, and I remember um, having a lot of good time with them and my friends and family, all my nieces and nephew. And I went to the hospital and I thanked the doctors and nurses for caring for my brother. And so grief was kept a little bit at bay for a few days. Now remember, I'd already lost my parents, so I knew what grief felt like. Then we got back in the car, my daughter and I, and we drove home. My 11-year-old was sleeping in the back. And I was driving along 680, and all of a sudden, I felt grief descending. And grief, to me, is a very heavy, heavy weight on my chest and my head. It hurts physically, and it hurts terribly emotionally. And I thought, oh God, here it comes. And I was prepared to just burst into tears. And at that moment, I was surrounded by a warmth engulfed by a warm cloud. I felt light. I don't know how you feel light, but I felt light. And I felt cared for. And somehow I got the message, you are going to be all right. You are my beloved child. I am holding you. It lasted for quite a while, and yet at the same time, I was very conscious of my sleeping child and the fact that I was driving on 680. I don't know how this could be, but I can tell you to this day, I remember it. And if God never, ever touched me with a moment of grace in my life, I need only that moment to say, I believe in God and I believe in the risen Christ because it came to me at the moment of my deepest need when I said, oh God, here it comes. There are ways that we can see the risen Christ globally, in our community, and in our own lives. And we as Christians are asked to bear witness to the risen Christ in our lives. What stories will you tell? I can't wait to hear them. Amen.